Hello, thank you for joining us today for our HAI at Work webinar on patrol with the Texas Department of Public Safety Aircraft Unit. Yeah, I think that's gonna be a, a lot of fun today. Uh, our guest speaker is uh, Clay Lacey and he's gonna do a great job for us. We're gonna get started in about a minute. We'd like to give everybody a chance to uh, join in. So we'll uh, see you in just a minute. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We appreciate uh, your waiting today. Again, uh, our panelist today is Lieutenant Clay Lacey with the Texas Department of Public Safety Aircraft Unit. Looking forward to uh, his presentation. Let's go ahead and uh, look at who's gonna be joining us today. We'll uh, of course have uh, Jim Viola, the President and CEO of Helicopter Association International and Lieutenant Clay Lacey, who's uh, in the training section of the Texas Department of Public Safety Aircraft Operations Division out of the Dallas area. This is an interactive webinar. We do encourage your participation uh, for Zoom. Please use the question panel, either in the bottom of your screen or on the side of your screen and submit your questions in writing. Following uh, Lieutenant uh, Lacey's presentation, we will answer as many of the questions as we have time for today. Uh, unfortunately, we don't always get to all of them, and so uh, we do try to answer as many of them as we can. This uh, presentation is being recorded, as always. The video will be emailed out to everybody who's uh, listening and watching. We will also make it available uh, on our website at uh, rotor.org slash webinar as soon as it's possible to uh, get that posted. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Jim, can you join us, please? Absolutely. So Dan, thanks for that. Um, today we'll be getting a briefing from an officer at the Department of Public Safety in Texas. Jim, don't have your camera. All right, let me try that again. Hmm. Sorry about that. How's that? There we go. All right, sorry about that. So today we will begin getting a briefing from an officer at the Department of Public Safety in Texas the second largest state law enforcement agency in the nation. These folks are always busy, logging tens of thousands of flight hours a year. In fact, airborne law enforcement was one of the steadiest performers during the recent pandemic. And when you say recent, you know, we're, we all know now we're well over a year into that. So while everybody, and probably not everybody that's watching here because most of the, uh, some of the results have been flying as well, but most people were working at home and social distancing and our first responders were still in the air. That they continued to serve the public interest by flying missions that supported the officers on the ground. They also conduct search and rescue missions. And if they're properly equipped based on the aircraft they're flying that day or night, they would perform air ambulance services. So of course, law enforcement and air, air ambulance services were not the only helicopter operators who kept flying our entire rotorcraft industry should be very proud of that fact that they also continue to fly. So while many commercial airplane operators were unable to fly, the rotorcraft community continued to serve the general public around the world. And we hear that from our international partners and hopefully some of those international partners are also on here today. So let's go ahead with this interactive webinar today and let's get things started. So let me introduce Lieutenant Clay Lacey of the Texas Department of Public Safety. Take it away. Hey, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Clay Lacey. I'm a Lieutenant Pilot with the Texas Department of Public Safety stationed in Mesquite, which is a suburb of Dallas. Uh, we cover Northeast Texas. Um, let me give you a little background on me. We'll watch a little video about our organization. Uh, I have a little PowerPoint about our organization. Uh, I've got another video a little bit about uh, some of the SAR work we do, the search and rescue component, uh, which is our life-saving missions, which I feel are, are the, obviously the most important, and then we'll have some time for, for question and answer. Um, I started my career as a Garland police officer um, a long, long time ago, and uh, Garland did not have any air assets. I was a late-night cop, loved chasing bad guys, loved going after them and putting them in jail. 
Um, ended up meeting along with a partner of mine, some Texas DPS pilots, and uh, they didn't have tactical flight officers at the time. Uh, the mission equipment on board the aircraft was just emerging. The technology was moving quickly, and the Department of Public Safety learned uh, that we need some specialists on that gear. So fast forward, I was assigned as a task force officer with the Garland Police Department, flying with DPS as a TFO. Uh, went through and, and, and got my uh, private helicopter rating on my own, and then uh, eventually uh, onboarded with the department, uh, directing and developing the TFO training program. And uh, since then, promoted to a pilot role. Uh, we still do both missions, and we're going to kind of get into that a little bit as we walk through this. Um, but uh, it's currently based in Dallas, and, uh, and we'll talk about that as we go on. I'm going to bring up a short video here that's an introduction to our unit. Um, it's only about four minutes, uh, shows a little bit about what we do and what we fly, and then we'll come back to the, uh, to the PowerPoint. I'm the chief pilot for the Texas Department of Public Safety here in Austin, Texas. Texas Department of Public Safety is the state police for the state of Texas. Within the Texas DPS are numerous divisions, Texas Rangers, Criminal Investigation Division, the Highway Patrol, Intelligence Counterterrorism, and also aircraft. We are our own division. The reason we exist is to support not only the state police in Texas, but all police agencies. We work with every agency in the state. I've been working for the Texas Department of Public Safety for 23 years total. I did the first five years in the Texas Highway Patrol. In the last 18 years, I've been assigned to the Aircraft Operations Division. Aircraft Operations Division flies about 11,300 hours per year. We operate 24 aircraft. The breakdown of that is 15 helicopters and nine fixed wings. Because we're located at 13 stations around the state. At every station we have at least one helicopter, 14 A-Star H-125. We have one EC-145. We average around 7,500 actual flights per year, and we actually average around 7,000 agency assists or cases that we're actually using the aircraft on. We perform a variety of missions. Our principal mission is criminal patrol or support of our state and local law enforcement. You know, ground officers all across the state with a myriad of missions to include manhunts, pursuits, missing persons, search and rescue, crime scene support, criminal photography, criminal surveillance. Uh, we're looking for bad guys and we're also looking for good people. The principal mission of our division is, is helicopter driven and so, but there are times that we require a, a fixed wing asset to work in concert with our helicopter and for that reason, our pilots need to be dual rated. Anything that requires an eye in the sky, maybe the use of technology to get men and equipment into a location fast and efficiently to better enforce the law and better conduct the mission. Most of our aircraft, uh, all the helicopters and about half of the fixed wing are equipped with infrared cameras. So our aircraft come with a crew. Usually a typical package is a pilot and a tactical flight officer. And that tactical flight officer, is he's the mission manager. He's managing the communications. Our, we have very sophisticated uh, radios that can talk across many different bands, which allows us to communicate with the local, the county, the federal, the state agencies. And along with that communications package, he's also running the camera. So he's running the infrared camera, which allows us to assist the guys on the ground, allows us to be a lot more effective day or night. Texas DPS has been flying that particular platform. We got our first BA back in the early 90s, and we quickly learned that it was a very capable aircraft, provided good visibility, good speed, good lift capability, allowed us to put very important equipment on it without weighting it down too much, good endurance, fairly low maintenance, um, so it, it, was a, it was perfect for what we needed to do.
Okay, uh, get back going here. This is a little introduction just to kind of about who we are. And we're going to touch on a little bit more of that as we start walking through the, uh, through the, the other portion of the presentation. I, I assure you we're going to try to make this not the, uh, the proverbial death by PowerPoint. But there are going to be some talking points that we're going to talk about um, in the short PowerPoint that we have here. And then we'll sum up with another video at the end of the presentation that highlights more of the SAR mission uh, that we do. So uh, as we walk through this, uh, once again, it's, it's summarizing a little bit about our organization. So we operate the 15 helicopters. Uh, four of them are, uh, 14 of them are the A-STARS uh, with one EC-145. We have AS-350, B-2, B-3, B-3E, H-125 variant. So we keep our aircraft a long time, sometimes 10 to, to 15 years, and uh, update the technology as we go. Uh, and then, as mentioned, we have the one EC-145. As far as airplanes, we have one Beechcraft Super King Air 350, a couple of caravans, uh, four stationaires, and two Pilatus PC-12s. Um, our total personnel, this is a little bit of a, of a moving target in that, uh, you know, through attrition, retirement, hiring, et cetera, uh, it varies. But generally speaking, about 25 to 30 TFOs, 50 to 55 pilots, including command staff. Um, our command staff operate aircraft, just like line pilots, all the way up to the chief pilot, actually flies missions uh, out of Austin. We have three non-sworn admins down in Austin, a couple electronics techs. With regard to maintenance, TxDOT, the Texas Department of Transportation, has a, uh, a, an aircraft uh, division that's, that actually handles all of our maintenance. So we have 15 personnel down in Austin that take care of our fixed wing and our rotary wing assets. And then we also have some spillover contracts for minor and major maintenance outside of TxDOT when TxDOT gets uh, too busy. Uh, there are times when uh, we have a major inspection, say the 12 years on the A-STARS where they're gonna be, uh, uh, could get pretty bogged down with that. So we have some things in place to move through those. So our air crews, as mentioned in the video, we're operating and managing communications, downlink equipment, camera sensors, moving maps, searchlights, uh, rescue equipment, the way the breakdown of the air crew works, generally speaking, is um, the pilot is operating the aircraft safely and the TFO is doing everything else. So the TFO is the mission manager. And uh, that's how we how we how we divide up uh, where people are at and what they're doing. Um, so moving into that, there's a snapshot from 2019 before uh, COVID when we could all get together. We get together for a safety stand to. Uh, that we have through the Airborne Public Safety Association, APSA. That is our uh, organization that represents and advocates on behalf of public safety aviation around the world. And uh, I teach with that organization as well, and I'm proud to do that. But they, we do a safety stand two once a year and bring in instructors and get together and, and talk shop. And that was a photo from that. Our aircraft duty stations, uh, these are the listings around the state of Texas. Uh, Texas is big. We're, we're 275,000 square miles, uh, about 800 miles uh, in length and about 750 in width, so, so big area. Um, I'm up in the Garland Station, northeast Texas, and our duty station runs from the Dallas area north to the Red River near Oklahoma, east to Louisiana, about halfway to Austin, and about halfway west to Midland. So pretty big area uh, to cover with the limited number of aircraft we have. Um, this is where we have helicopters. We don't have airplanes in every station, but we do have uh, helicopters in each station. Um, kind of a photo shot of our older, one of our older A-STARS with some older panels. Uh, I'd like to show that a little bit. You're seeing the TFO in the left seat with moving map systems, thermal imager, radios, that sort of thing. Um, and then in the right seat, you have the pilot operating, operating some of our older glass. Um, and, and like I said, we've slowly updated that from, uh, from this is, say, a 2007 model with some of the older equipment. Now we're moving into more of the glass. Uh, with This is our latest H-125 that's based here in Dallas. Um, it was completed by Metro Aviation, who has handled all of our helicopter completion since 2007. And uh, they come equipped from Airbus with quite a bit of, of, of equipment in terms of glass, GTN 650s, G500s, a lot of the, the Garmin products. And then you can see we add a lot of mission equipment. So uh, Eagle Audio, Digital Audio, Technosonic, Police Radios, um, uh, different monitor systems, Macro Blue, Airborne Displays, 
We even had a uh, display over at the pilot's right knee uh, with a cyclic toggle where you can rock through hoist cams, tail boom cams, IR cams. You're actually seeing the tail cam in that G500 in the main MSD of the Garmin that's looking down the tail of the aircraft. So when we're doing uh, off airport stuff, we, we have good situational awareness around the aircraft. Another shot of the left side, uh, quad display on our mission management equipment uh, where we can actually send live high definition digital video and audio down a downlink pipe to receive sites around the state of Texas uh, for that for that good command and control platform that we're looking for during law enforcement emergencies, SAR, rescue, hurricanes, Hurricane Harvey was a big one. Uh, and we'll talk about that in the next, or it'll be discussed in the next video. A little close up there, the right side, uh, 125. Um, we moved some things around, panel space is limited. And, and, and with that said, a lot of people ask, well, well why are you in what you're in? Uh, the manufacturers make outstanding aircraft. All of them do. Uh, this serves us well. Uh, the, the large, wide panel. Um, I'm, I'm a, a fairly big guy, and most officers are, so there's plenty of space in there and, and useful load and power uh, to accommodate the many, uh, many missions that we do. Um, that's a picture, one of the latest ones. Like I said, uh, standard equipment there. You're seeing the Westcam MX-10 turret hanging down the, uh, the Linksys uh, downlink is the white antenna on the front nose. Spectrolab Searchlight, uh, Goodrich Hoist, kind of the basic LE. I say basic LE package. I, other than floats, I don't know that we could, we could add anything else to her. And she's sort of a pig. She's pretty heavy uh, with all this stuff on, but does a good job for us. Um, great aircraft and like I said we're at we're at 15 helicopters and 14 of them are these into the airplane world uh, we have those around the state also that, that do different missions this is the lo these are the locations the duty stations that have those aircraft um, those aircraft consist of like I said the the uh, King Air Super King Air here the 350 and then the Pilatus is the caravans and the station air 206s the types of missions, um, you know, most important missions for us are what we call the life-saving missions. That's our search and rescue. That's uh, hoisting. That's the missing children, the missing Alzheimer's, 20 degrees outside. So as we triage our mission set, it's life, limb, or eyesight first, right? So our air crews are given a tremendous amount of autonomy to operate that aircraft in the best interest of the citizens of the state of Texas. That's our mission protect and serve the citizens uh, of Texas. And we do that through a set of core values. Uh, the core values of our department are integrity, excellence, accountability, and teamwork. Uh, it's not a motto. Uh, we live those. We live those values in order to do that mission. So our air crew has full autonomy to decide what missions will be accepted and flown and what won't. And life, limb, or eyesight comes first. Uh, that said, we move into some of these other things, manhunt, criminal patrol, stolen vehicle, um, surveillance, uh, photo missions, general transportation. We move things uh, and people around in our aircraft quite a bit. During the, the recent last couple of years of COVID, we were flying COVID tests from the rural communities in Texas uh, back to the, the urban hubs to be processed quickly. And now, as, as I speak now, we're still flying vaccines uh, out of the urban centers around Texas and out to the rural areas. A disaster reconnaissance for we're, we're in the middle of severe weather season kicking off. So uh, tornadoes, fire floods, hurricanes, flew over 240 voice missions during Hurricane Rita. I'm sorry, Hurricane Harvey, showing how old I am. Uh, thermal missions, water rescues, evacuations. And then the final bullet point there is border security, which is uh, spun up for us tremendously within the last uh, couple of months. Uh, we are we are down there uh, very, very busy along the Texas-Mexico border, over a thousand miles of that. And uh, we are tasked with supporting our federal partners in uh, detecting and deterring criminal activity that crosses into the United States. So move forward on the uh, SAR overview real quick. Move past that. It's kind of for fun here. This is a little bit of our short haul. I keep this slide in here. We, we're moving away from short haul. Um, for those that are new or newer to the industry, short haul is where we're we're hanging essentially a, a line from under the aircraft and picking up folks or things and moving them a short distance. It's so vertical reference flying. I think it's very challenging. Um, it's obviously inherently dangerous. And uh, we've done that mission for a long time. Um, hoisting for us is taking the place of this. We feel like we can do that and mitigate risk better uh, through hoist operations. 
And uh, the problem is, as you know, not every aircraft is STC for a hoist uh, that we can use. So we don't have hoists on all our helicopters, but down the road, uh, due to us being tasked with that mission, uh, we, will, we will continue to spec them out. Um, aerial use of force, a lot of folks ask us if we shoot from the aircraft, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we have an aerial use of force program. Uh, it's a very narrow scope mission that requires a high level specialization, uh, training and accountability. Uh, anytime we are circling over the citizens who uh, we support and protect with a rifle and a helicopter, that's a serious thing. Um, so our crews uh, train heavily for this, dedicated two weeks a year um, at ranches and undisclosed locations, go out and do practice for this maneuver. And then uh, um, every couple of months in the local duty stations, keep that current. Um, that's used everywhere from urban areas, uh, rural areas, into the urban areas. Um, when we lost five police officers in downtown Dallas, uh, I was working that night. And um, fortunately, there were three of us there. We had an AUF package, and we were over downtown Dallas in short order, supporting our partners at Dallas PD uh, with, uh, with the worst night of my law enforcement career. Uh, we didn't have an opportunity to engage uh, the shooter in that situation. He was inside, but we did provide overwatch and uh, uh, any opportunities to interdict that threat. Uh, fortunately, as you all know, Dallas police took care of it and, uh, and moved on. Um, another view of overwatch support for ground units uh, teams that are on the ground. Um, we exist in our organization to support our customers. The boys and girls, men and women on the ground are the most important thing to our organization. And our mission is twofold. Number one, to keep them safe, to make sure that they go home with all their fingers and toes as they protect citizens. And uh, number two is to complete the mission catching the bad guy. So um, safety is a huge uh, thing for us. Um, and that's through officer safety and, and also uh, enhancing citizen safety. Um, so let me break out of this now. So just going to hit on a couple of topics. Um, folks have asked, uh, uh, here, folks have asked us, you know, asked a lot about how do you get into the unit and, and what does that look like? And, and we are a little bit different, uh, than the rest of the industry. So, uh, we are a part 91 operation. We comply with all the federal aviation regulations under part 91, unless we're doing some sort of mission set that is just logistically impossible to be 91 in that moment uh, where we're doing hoisting and long lining and shooting and that kind of thing. It's hard to squeeze that into the FARs, but we operate 91. We maintain the aircraft in 91. All of our pilots are commercial uh, pilots at a minimum. Um, we are blessed to work for an organization that will pay for any rating you want to achieve. And we do most of that training in-house. Our chief pilot encourages adding ratings and continually making yourself better. Um, so folks have asked, well, you know, how do you, uh, how do you come into the unit? And then what does that look like? And this is where it gets a little bit uh, discouraging for some folks. I'm not going to read this to you, but it's some of our requirements. Um, so CRM, crew resource management. Um, we've, we've learned a lot over time about that on the aviation side, but, but CRM is also making use of all the equipment on board the aircraft and the people on board the aircraft to safely uh, and effectively, effectively conduct your mission. And for us, there is a CRM component in that cockpit that just requires both folks have a law enforcement background. So um, we take people in through internally through our organization. So that's coming from the DPS you hire on as a uh, a trooper go through the DPS Academy in Austin, Texas, and have to do an amount of time on the road serving the citizens as a sworn state trooper uh, before you're eligible to test and move into anywhere else in the department, whether it's the Texas Rangers, the Tactical Marine Unit, any of these things, you have to have a core uh, law enforcement background. Uh, we also require, as you can see here, a private license in something. Uh, we want someone to come in. Usually it's an airplane rating because, as we all know here, the helicopter training is expensive. Um, so once you meet those requirements, you test uh, and we onboard you there and uh, you move through our training program. Uh, we have CFIs, CFIs, ATPs. Uh, we have our own Czech Airmen 
in house that we get everybody up and running. It's absolutely a crawl, walk, run uh, model. Um, and, and we'll slowly release someone after they have their commercial instrument. They might have a, a day authorization letter only with some really high weather minimums and no police calls. So maybe those folks are taking an A-star into maintenance, right? So they're doing VFR cross-country flights alone, uh, but no police missions um, of any kind and just, just building up their experience. And then as we move along, uh, they get released to do more and more and more. The chief pilot updates their pilot and command letter to add specialized missions, nighttime, daytime, helicopter, uh, AUF, uh, hoisting, and then into the airplane world as well. And that can take time. Uh, somebody to get through uh, dual ratings and have PIC day-night letters in both aircraft, it may take five years, depending on where your duty station is. Um, uh, if you're in a duty station that's busy, that has a lot of instructors, that has plenty of aircraft, that might go a little bit faster. So that's a little bit of the path into the unit. Some folks have asked us, do you have any civilian pilots? Do you hire any civilian pilots? The answer to that used to be no. It's not true now because there's an asterisk, and I know some ears probably just perked up hearing this. We have hired back some former DPS pilots. They worked their career with us and they, and they retired. And they went on the retired life and we have hired them back as contract civilian pilots to fill needs that we have internally uh, because through attrition and, and just the, the industry, it's difficult uh, to get people hired in. It's difficult to get people hired into law enforcement right now. Um, you, you have a, it's highly competitive. You have a limited pool that can apply for that job and everyone's competing for those people. So uh, we, we, we have done that. So you will see three, four, five uh, of our folks who, who are civilians, but they're retired police. Um, and, then, and then the rest of the requirements, uh, rest of the requirements you see there. Um, so, you know, beyond that, the mission set, uh, we're getting back to the autonomy. We, we generally staff the aircraft with two folks. Um, they're working, they're monitoring police radios. Um, and, and they self-dispatch or they are called to police missions. Uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the only people that have air assets is Dallas and Fort Worth from a, from, a, from a local county state perspective. There are some federal aircraft here. So all these big suburbs, you know, Arlington, Garland, Mesquite, Plano, thousands of people and law enforcement agencies with no assets, um, we, we support those. And we're in a unique environment here in Dallas. We have Airbus here. We have Bell Helicopter here in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Sky Helicopters uh, is where I did my private uh, training on my own and got my private helicopter license in a 300 is over in Garland. So we have a lot of industry partners here in the Dallas area and a lot of aircraft, uh, a lot of aircraft flying. Um, so, so, you know, with that, um, kind of want to move into, we'll move into one more video. This one's a little longer. And uh, to sum up kind of the SAR component of what we do, and then we'll kind of open up. I'm sure there's going to be some questions, and, and I want to leave plenty of time to address whatever I can, I can address to that. So uh, let's crank this up for you. DPS Aircraft operates 24 aircraft comprised of 15 helicopters and 9 fixed wings, but only 4 of the 15 helicopters are hoist equipped. The other 11 we still can use in a search and rescue, but we use a different technique called short haul. Currently we have about 48 pilots and about 23 tactical flight officers. DPS 1072. I got overturned bow, possible two victims in the water. Cordra, follow 30-4-8-2-2-7. 47 copy. Two adults, one child, car washed away. We have multiple aircraft in the area. We're going to deconflict on VHF channel 130. How copy? We average about 11,200 flight hours per year. We do about 7,200 flights, over 7,000 agency assists, and we have 12 duty stations that are spread out throughout the state.
Can you look at 911? What's your emergency? Uh, yes, my name is and I was just down at the river. Yes, sir. And the lady came floating by, hollering for help. I was off duty. Uh, actually, my wedding anniversary was that day, and my wife and I had a day planned and received a phone call um, that I was needed to come in and assist with hoist rescues uh, in the Junction, Texas area. A woman is in the flood holding onto a log, okay. screaming for help. Okay, where, where at? Got my equipment together, got dressed, and uh, headed down to the San Antonio office. The helicopter was already uh, pre-flighted. Equipment um, from the other air crews that were there at work had already been loaded into the aircraft. And Captain Sean Stevens and I departed the San Antonio area and headed up towards Junction. All right, we're getting prelim information, but there's up to uh, five victims stuck in the Llano River near Junction. While en route, I exchanged text messages and emails with uh, several members of our ground support team uh, that were providing information on possible locations of victims that we need to look for, as well as landing zones, fuel uh, availability, and other assets that we might need. Once we got into the area, the weather was still poor. Visibility is three quarters of a mile and water is rising rapidly. Copy that. And also, uh, would you dispatch a fuel trailer in the area with about 500 gallons of jet aid? How come? Uh, we got another victim in this uh, AOR, Lano River. Spectre 243 copies direct, Lano River, um, one victim 20 miles down the river. We received tasking of a female that had been washed away earlier in the morning and it had been reported floating down river. Uh, the command post had received several 911 calls. They were actually in trail of each other, plotting her course. What kind of 911? Do you have an emergency? Yes, I do. At that point, we realized that this rescue had to happen immediately, or we didn't believe that she was going to make it. We arrived on scene. I spotted the female in the water and directed Captain Stevenson with the aircraft over to where she was at. The female had climbed on top of a large piece of driftwood. As we lowered the rescue swimmer down to her, she was struck by another piece of debris. She then became entangled in the top of a tree. But again, before Sergeant Tibbet could get to her, she was struck by more debris and lost her grip and then continued again downriver. Because of the amount of debris that was in the river, it would change her direction and speed at any given time. So after several failed attempts at that, we ended up going downriver and we basically just met her in the middle. As she approached Sergeant Tibbet, he reached reached out and with one hand was able to grab the victim. Once I was able to securely grab a hold of her and apply the rescue strap to her, I immediately gave the thumbs up for evacuation. The look on her face was just sheer exhaustion. I immediately started reeling him in with a hoist and we were able to lift him and the victim out of the water. She was short hauled, transported uh, directly to a shoreline where we had emergency personnel standing by. It was determined she had traveled approximately 23 miles and about five hours in the water. I firmly believe, after reviewing the case and the video, that this was the victim's last chance of survival. We have a variety of missions. Our primary function is criminal patrol, border interdiction, support state and local law enforcement on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, one of our most important missions, our highest priority, uh, would be what I call a life-saving mission. When we're talking about search and rescue and hoisting, certainly that falls into that category. It's much safer to conduct rescues with a hoist equipped machine rather than a long line or a short haul when you're carrying a victim with a 100-foot rope over obstacles and terrain. Hey, uh, 145, we're inbound with one on long line. Another advantage of a hoist machine is being able to bring your rescue victims up into the cabin and therefore you can travel to a casualty collection point in a much safer fashion. Texas DPS has an outstanding relationship with the Texas Army National Guard. Whereas they usually have to go through an activation process and have to get orders cut, we can respond really with little or no notice to the uh, life-saving mission. And the good thing about working with them is we have interoperability, compatibility, and familiarity because we've worked with them for so many years. So for that person on the rooftop that's in peril, we're there to save their life. That's, that's what Texas DPS does. Every year we participate with our military and law enforcement partners in what's called SAREX, a full-on training scenario, much like a real response after a hurricane. Before each deployment, we'll do some risk assessments, and that'll involve both the pilot, the crew chief, and rescue swimmer. 
Another element of that is we have a very robust SMS program or safety management system. As an aviation safety officer, you want to make sure that each crew member that is going to undertake a hoist operation, that they're able to review those performance limitations before they even head out and go fly the mission. Review things such as your center of gravity, max gross weight in the helicopter, taking into account your crew members and also the victims that you're performing rescue missions on. Once an incident gets reported, we make sure that we evaluate it through a safety committee and then we make recommendations to the leadership. Once we do make a recommendation, we make sure it's documented and we want to make sure that we provide that feedback to the crew member that provided that piece of information. That way you can build a safety culture within your unit. The Pilatus platform is specifically built for a law enforcement type application which falls hand in hand with search and rescue. These operations usually are conducted in inclement and deteriorating weather conditions. If we respond to a hurricane, well, then obviously we've got some weather concerns. These are low to the ground operations that require a high degree of coordination and skill between our crew chiefs and our pilots. When we train our pilots, we train our hoist crew chiefs, tactical flight officers, we start from the very basic and we divide it up into a series of modules and we start crawl, walk, run through those modules until they get to a proficiency level that we can authorize them to conduct these maneuvers. Baskets uh, in the water. Okay, we're good at 60%, we're pretty strong. All right, centered over load, ready for pickup. Pick pick up. Up. All right, power check, easy back, easy right. Back and right, power's good. All right. My fastest coming up. You're okay. clear of obstruction, ready for easy forward flight. Easy forward. I think a lot of times when we see these videos of these hoist rescues that our uh, pilots and TFOs are, are, are doing, uh, they make it look easy. And I can assure you that this is not an easy maneuver to do, but the fact that they're getting so proficient at it, I think is a credit to our training the principal reason that you need an aircraft like this is because any time that you're actively working on the backside of a storm like Hurricane Harvey, you're going to be in some bad weather. We flew for about four days straight in IFR conditions. We still accumulated some ice, but again, this type of platform is built and designed for that. This airplane is equipped with weather radar and certified in flying into known icing conditions. We tend as an industry to always think about the helicopter component. For obvious reasons, the helicopter is kind of the principal and key player to these responses. But DPS adopted the use of the command and control fixed wing asset out of necessity to simplify a complex rescue and try to take the chaos out of a chaotic environment. One of the advantages of using this type of aircraft is it has long station time. So we can go from six to eight hours of duration on one event without landing. We hear from the pilots that they appreciate having that extra set of eyes and having an overwatch that can maybe take some of the workload off of them. Some examples of that would be identifying casualty collection points, keeping records, keeping up with what capability different assets have. I know our crew takes extra time and effort to make sure that once we evacuate family members, we're able to reunite those family members. This, this sounds simple enough, but when you're working in one of these mass victim responses, it's easier said than done. We're at the Meadow River RV park. Our camper is moving and we are in the camper and it's flooding and we need to get out of here. Somebody needs to get us out of this camper. Okay, so sorry I know it ran a little bit long, but I thought it was a pretty good uh, snapshot of, of, of that component of our mission and, and what we're doing. Uh, kind of to wrap up until we kind of move into a Q&A portion, I just want to hit on, um, this is a wonderful job. I think uh, the only better job than the job that I have is to not have to have a job, right? Um, if you have a itch to serve, um, you're going to have to scratch it. It's not going to go away. I think some of us are just born with that. And there's many ways you can do that, uh, obviously. Uh, teachers, doctors, um, police, fire, that kind of thing. This was my path, um, and, and I'm blessed to be able to do this. Um, so with that, um, 
if aviation is super strong with you and helicopters, uh, they are with us too. But bigger than that, bigger than that is that service. And you have to have that with us or you won't be happy here. Um, Because I've been doing this a long time and I still work all the holidays and the nights and the long 16 hour days and deploy to the border. And um, that stuff is difficult. And, and like I said, um, flying is, is rewarding. It's fun to fly. Helicopters are fantastic. But uh, we have a very big uh, service component to our mission. And we require, we demand that our air crew members uh, rise to that service requirement. Um, so kind of with that, I, I hope that provided you some information on us. And, and what I'll kind of do is stand down a little bit and, and be available uh, for Dan to uh, to direct us on anything that we want to address. I do appreciate that, uh, Clay. That was an, uh, an awesome presentation. I think you've answered uh, a lot of the questions, but I know that there's uh, still some interest in some of the topics you t- uh, brushed on, and so maybe we can get a little bit more details. Um, since you finished up with uh, the service requirements, if you will, let's uh, let's talk about those for a little bit. Um, Somebody asked specifically, can you detail the career path for the uh, Texas to public, uh, Department of Public Safety officers? Um, I saw that ground experience is necessary, and then it said that uh, you have to have a private license. Um, are, are you looking for people, people with the minimums in both cases, or do you have applicants that uh, have uh, more experience? Well, uh, we have both. What we're looking for is someone who you will come in as a trooper, you will work the road, and and we are looking for outstanding uh, police officers, state troopers that shine in what they do serving the public. And then we can bring them in in two different paths. Uh, One path is a tactical flight officer, and they come in, start there. Uh, The other path is a pilot. There's a lot of TFOs that do TFOing and then move over and test for pilot. So that's common. Um, but I say this jokingly, but kind of not jokingly, we can, we, can, we can train almost anybody to handle the aircraft and fly the orbits. Um, uh, we always say a trained uh, baboon uh, can fly the aircraft under normal circumstances. Now, I don't mean that ugly. These TFOs are special people. These TFOs that are over these five dead officers that are running seven police radios with over 2,700 frequencies in them. Uh, And and the cameras and the payloads are phenomenal. And so we're we're, we're mainly looking for those people that can work that CRM between each other. So the path, again, you're going to go work the road and then start testing, come in as a TFO or come in uh, 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 as a pilot. We have had multi-thousand hour pilots that test for this job after they go to the highway patrol and we don't hire them. They're not, they're not coming for the right reasons. They're not coming to serve in the way that we think they need to serve. So we don't put much on a ton of aviation experience. We can get them that in-house. Well, that answers or brings up a question we just had pop up. I saw pop up on the screen. Do you accept uh, transfers from, uh, say, out of state or out of other agencies, uh, perhaps even the federal government or ex-military? Uh, it, we have enough uh, flexibility built into our programs that anything is possible, but it would be very, very rare that even that individual wouldn't have to go through our uh, uh, road work as a highway patrol a trooper and, and, and go that route. Um, so it, it would be very rare. Okay. Um Honestly, this sounds like a great opportunity. And so, I mean, with the, the training that you folks offer and the capabilities with the aircraft, and uh, do you have a high turnover? Are there all, how often do you look for new pilots? We, are, we don't have a high attrition rate on the pilot side. The TFO side nationwide has a, has a fairly high rollover rate because it's so hard. Now, we've done a lot over in the industry over the years about, about picking people a little bit better for the job. And, and we've brought that down some, but no, most of the time people come in and stay. And, but I, I, again, I'll give you that example. I've been in it 20 years. I'm not a young man anymore. And, and, and it's hard. It's hard to rotate back and forth tonight. It's hard to go fly in marginal VFR on life-saving missions. It's stressful. Um, we're not all your senses as you get older aren't as good as they were. Um, so it's a challenge, and, and I hate to say it's a young man's game, but in a lot of ways it is, 
Um, so I'm going to keep doing it as long as I'm healthy enough to do it and continue to serve. Um, but, but that service has got to be there. That's a key component. Well, you talked about the rotation. What did, can you talk, walk us through, say, an average week or an average month? How, do, how does your rotation work uh, for your officers? Okay, so in my duty station, we have 10 uh, uh, folks, six pilots, and uh, four tactical flight officers. We staff a night shift seven days a week. So generally speaking, you are on good nights uh, where you have weekends off for a month, and then you go to bad nights where you're working on the weekends for a month, and then you might be on a day shift for a month or two. So maybe, you know, a month or two of days, month or two of nights. But, but as I said, the big asterisk there is, for example, the border is exploding. So our, I have teams here in Dallas that we have two crew members deployed to the border constantly. So about every four weeks, you're driving in your truck 700 miles to South Texas to staff a machine down there for a week, staying in a hotel, and working, uh, working the border. So it's, it's not a set schedule by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we, we do what we can, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's tough. Well, uh, man, you're just giving me these great lead-ins questions I already was thinking about, you know, looking at the map and seeing where your duty stations were along the border. You know, what kind of relationship or, uh, do you have with the other agencies that fly along that border? Oh, I'm proud or, or to operate and conduct uh, law enforcement along the border. I'm proud to say it's very good. Um, uh, we, we, we have a lot of outreach with our mainly down there. It's our federal partners uh, that are working down there. And, and to be honest, lately, uh, everything we've got from them is they've been thankful that we're there. Uh, they are truly being just overloaded and in ways that, that you can't imagine. Uh, the whole federal system down there. And, and they are thankful for the support because as you can imagine, uh, when you're dealing with one thing and your crew is tied up with one type of activity, other nefarious activities, especially criminal activities are running amok. And, and the, the cartels in Mexico take advantage of that. They understand that they can load in certain areas and then work human trafficking, illegal narcotics, that kind of things in other areas. So we have a good relationship. The big thing we have to work hard on is deconfliction. Uh, you know, uh, we always say big sky, little airplane, but we all seem to find each other, you know, often. But with the with the explosion of unmanned aerial assets, uh, tethered systems, and then manned aircraft assets, we have a robust uh, deconfliction uh, system down there that helps us to keep from, from trading paint with one another. You bring up uh, the unmanned aircraft systems or remotely piloted aircraft. Uh, does DPS uh, use either of those uh, options? DPS does. We have an unmanned aerial program. That program falls under the Aircraft Operations Division, which is us. However, uh, we, we handle it from an administrative perspective, and these assets are actually field deployed to other divisions. So we have 107 drone pilots that are in the highway patrol, and they're working fatal accident scenes. They're doing uh, uh, measurements for that stuff. We have them deployed to our criminal investigations division where they're doing search warrants and photography. Um, so we do. Uh, we, we believe that the assets uh, can go work together and, and we certainly use them. We just don't pilot them. We don't man them ourselves. Okay. Um, question from Steve Laird. Uh, what is the ground per unit pursuit policy for DPS? Well, hello, Steve. Thank you for the question. Long time no see. Um, but, you know, the po police pursuits right now are certainly very taboo. It's the thing in the world that everyone's trying to run away from in some form or fashion. The Department of Public Safety, uh, in pursuit of its mission to protect and serve the citizens of Texas, are going to aggressively uh, go after criminals and try to put them in jail. Um, so troopers are allowed to pursue and uh, use their judgment. Uh, on, on hopefully terminating that pursuit quickly through stop sticks, uh, through intervention methods, and, and get, the, get the chase shut down. But it is, it is very rare that you're going to see the Texas Highway Patrol uh, stop uh, chasing someone. Okay. I have a question from one of our longtime viewers, uh, Gabriel Amato. Um, he, he likes your videos and wants to know if they're available on YouTube so that he can uh, share them with uh, his police department. There are. There's several videos on YouTube. Uh, 
under, I believe they're under our department's YouTube page. I didn't use them here because I was worried about bandwidth and it buffering and, and all the presentation. So these were locally stored on my hard drive. But I think if you'll do a quick YouTube search, you'll find some some material similar to this. Um, there was a, a mention in your video, uh, the second video on SMS. How important is SMS to your agency? It's the core. Uh, if you don't have a robust safety management system, and in, in my opinion, um, you're 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 not a professional organization, and you're asking for trouble. Um, so. For us, what that looks like is uh, our chief pilot supports a just culture. Uh, we're not going to get into the who that did something, of the, but more of the why. How did this happen to us, and how do we prevent it from happening in the future? Uh, if that takes us to the who, and we had a rogue person uh, doing some bad things, then that will come out. But, but our interest is to mitigate risk. Uh, you know, we always say, uh, my friend Brian Smith with APSA says, well, you know, it's not a safety first. And I agree with him. You know, we put that out there, safety first, safety first. Well, if that was the case, we'd leave the helicopters in the hangar and take the blades off. I mean, you know, we're, we, we, there is an inherent risk in what we do. What we need to do is mitigate that risk. And that's done through, in my opinion, a robust safety management system with safety officers in every duty station reporting to a committee that reports directly to the chief pilot and, and documenting and capturing that safety information. That's good to hear. Uh, this kind of question is kind of tongue in cheek uh, from James Jobin. In the, uh, the first video, you showed an officer on the side door of uh, the helicopter with a weapon. Is this person assigned to DPS aircraft operations or is he a street officer who has a fun week hanging out the door? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of folks ask that. We have, uh, we have worked this a couple of different ways. As it currently stands, we find that it is much better for us to take internally our tactical flight officers and train them in this mission because about 95% of the airborne use of force shooting from the helicopter mission has nothing to do with pressing the trigger. Hopefully it's CRM. It's crew resource management. That shooter is a crew member on board the aircraft interacting with the air crew. And then to take one of our people that already has that down. And all we got to do is dial up the shooting component, which is only, three to 5% of the mission, it's more bang for the buck than say putting a SWAT officer who's a very good shooter, but has limited experience on board the aircraft. Uh, there's, there's CRM issues there, which goes back to your safety management system. So uh, they're all internal, mostly internal. Okay. Uh, I think this one might've been answered uh, during your presentation. Do you only do search and rescue only on the uh, 145 or do you include uh, the A-STARS with that as well? Uh, every air asset is 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 potentially going to do search and rescue, um, but our helicopters are the ones that are handling the short haul, long line, and hoisting. The airplanes are more of a a uh, uh, an asset that does the command and control. It seems silly, but for example, in Harvey, you know these poor people are bagging up everything they have in a gallon Ziploc bag, and they're leaving behind their home from a rooftop. And there may be four, there may be five of them. We, we have an obligation to get those people together at the same casualty collection points. And, and we've learned from that. It was, we, were, we, would, we would hoist the dad over here and the mom over here. Cell phones are down. No one can talk. That's very traumatic. So those, those aviation assets are able to keep track of where those helicopters are dropping victims so that we can make sure folks get back to their families. Okay, uh, Clay, honestly, it looks like uh, the majority of the questions have been answered. There's a, there were quite a number of them that uh, came in that dealt with uh, people who are apparently interested in transferring uh, their experience from uh, their current uh, agency to uh, yours. I, I think you made a, uh, quite a presentation, quite an impact on people. Um, speaking of that, is, is there one thing that if uh, for the, the people who are viewing this now or viewing the video that you uh, would really like to have them take away from your presentation, what would it might be? Um, probably what I said a little bit about service. Um, I think there's nothing more rewarding than to serve one another. Um, and I think the best thing we can do in, in life is serve our fellow man and take care of one another. And I think it's important. And so if you have that same belief, if you have that same itch that I say that needs to be scratched, uh, the Texas Department of Public Safety is an excellent way 
to get on board with a professional organization with wonderful benefits, wonderful pay, wonderful retirement, and most importantly, uh, directly be able to help each other. And uh, that's the blessing that I have is that opportunity to do that. Well, that's normally our wrap-up question, but you just kind of intrigued me with something um, about the service. Has there been one mission that uh, stays with you that uh, really has meant something to you over your career? Well, I've been blessed to be a part of, 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 of plenty, and that's the other thing about being in air. You're going to be at every big thing there is. You know, uh, you are that asset that the ground units use, whether the space shuttle blows up over Texas and we're going out looking for debris or, or five dead officers in downtown Dallas. Uh, the life-saving missions are the most important, and uh, I had one early in my career with a with a two-year-old boy in Johnson County that that went missing, and everyone had all but given up, and that child was out for two or three days uh, through some thunderstorms, and uh, and my partner called me on a Sunday and said, you know, I think we ought to go back down there. Uh, if he got in a stock tank and drowned, he should be floating by today. At least we can get him back to his folks. And we went down there uh, on the day off, and, and the first place we looked, there he is. And uh, he was face down, uh, Kevin Brown, he was face down. And uh, we landed, and I ran over to him, hollering at him, and I got close, and he looked up and was alive and fire ant bit and had the same diaper on for three days. But we loaded him up, took him to the hospital. And uh, I believe the good Lord put us in the right place at the right time on that deal. Uh, but that's, it doesn't get any better than that. That's, that's what it's all about. No, that sounds uh, absolutely fantastic. Well, Clay, thank you for not only your time today, thank you for not only for giving back, but thank you for uh, your service to the state of Texas and to uh, the thank public you. in general. Um, you. Your presentation was uh, really quite moving and really appreciate that you took the time to share it with us today. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it very much. Okay, well, we hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, the rest of your week uh, goes smoothly. Fly thank safely. You. Okay, well, let me go ahead and uh, we've got a couple of quick things to wrap up here. Um, hit the right buttons. Okay, for next week, save the date. Uh, our webinar, uh, as always, will be four o'clock uh, next Thursday afternoon. Uh, we had mentioned earlier on that uh, because we were not able to hold Heli Expo this year, we were going to be featuring some of our Salute to Excellence winners. Next week, we will be saluting or uh, honoring our Salute to Excellence Pilot of the Year, who is a U.S. Coast Guard uh, Lieutenant Commander, Robert uh, McCabe. Uh, part of uh, the narrative for his award is that uh, when he was out on a rescue mission, he went out and uh, he and the co-pilot uh, co suffered uh, spatial disorientation. And Lieutenant Commander McCabe recognized the situation. They corrected for it. Uh, they completed the mission, but he came back and then started talking with uh, the Coast Guard about it. And it wasn't just his uh, duty station. It became something that they uh, have worked on across the uh, US Coast Guard because obviously they're flying in inclement weather on, weather on a regular basis. And so this is an issue that was very important to them. And so uh, we're looking at a presentation not only honoring uh, Lieutenant Commander McCabe, but also a presentation from the U.S. Coast Guard on IIMC and spatial disorientation. Please uh, plan to join us for this one. It's going to be very important for pilots. Please uh, share the information uh, with uh, your friends and coworkers. Uh, we will be posting the link right away uh, on our website. We will be posting it in Rotor Daily and in social media as well. I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, I've also been looking forward to uh, the next flight of the Mars helicopter. It just keeps going and going and going. I really appreciated the presentation we had uh, recently on the uh, assembly and flight of the uh, Mars helicopter. We still do have uh, clothing and items in our uh, HAI store, uh, rotor.org. You can find it um, uh, under the about section. And then of course, I've been leaving this uh, screen up for just a little while. You can go back and uh, watch the recording if you want to watch the, or read the direct link there for it as well. But uh, Helicopter Association Interplanetary was our temporary name change in honor of the uh, Perseverance and Integrity uh, Program. 
feedback. There will be a questionnaire coming to you shortly. Please uh, take uh, just a few moments and answer the questions. We do pay attention to it. We do want to see uh, ideas of what you want to see for future webinars, what we might've done right, what we might've done wrong uh, with current or past webinars. Uh, we always appreciate your feedback. Um, if you have something for HAI in general, we always look for feedback there as well. It's very important to us, especially from our members. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What can we do better? What would you like to see us do more of? Send that directly to uh, Jim Viola, president at rotor.org. He does see all those emails and he does task us, uh, staff members with that, uh, with those duties. That brings us to a close. We appreciate that you took time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Uh, until next week, we ask that you be safe and you fly safe and we'll see you next week.